Good morning. I'm Julie Grelo, the Chief Medical Officer for the American Society of Clinical Oncology, along with my co-chair, Dr. Bill Kantz, who is the Chief uh, Medical and Scientific Officer for the American Cancer Society. I'd like to welcome you to this satellite session on clinical trials in low and middle resource settings, a focus on Africa. We're very excited about this session. We hope that you're engaged uh, and, be, and you're involved in the discussion. We want questions uh, in the panel part of this. We're going to start with a few introductory presentations uh, to set the stage. And then we will move to a panel discussion on increasing diversity, market access, and capacity in oncology registration trials is Africa the answer, with a terrific panel of representatives from various perspectives. Uh, in our introductory presentations, we'll first hear from Jennifer Dent. She's the president of BioVentures and Global Health She'll be speaking on building capacity for cancer clinical trials in Africa, the African Consortium for Cancer Clinical Trials, or AC3T. We'll then hear from Dr. Kasa Ayalu. He's the branch chief in the Division of Good Clinical uh, Practice Compliance at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the US FDA. He'll be speaking on the FDA's perspective on international clinical trials. And then we'll hear from Dr. Abu Bakar Bello. Uh, he is the president of the African Organization on Research and Training in Cancer, and he's the immediate past head of the Department of Radiotherapy and Oncology at the National Hospital in Abuja, Nigeria. He'll be talking about strengthening cancer clinical trials networks in Africa, the African Organization on Research and Training in Cancer's Clinical Trial Initiative. So let's jump to our first three introductory presentations. Good morning. I'm thrilled to be here um, today, kicking off this important satellite session, Clinical Trials in Low and Middle Resource Settings, a focus on Africa at the Accelerating Anti-Cancer Agent Development and Validation Meeting. My name is Jennifer Dent. I'm the president and CEO of BioVentures for Global Health, or BVGH, a nonprofit organization based in Seattle, Washington, that works at the crossroads of the private and public sectors to advance research and improve global health. I will be speaking today about building capacity for cancer clinical trials in Africa and the African Consortium for Cancer Clinical Trials. Africa is facing a cancer crisis, with new cancer cases and deaths in Africa predicted to double by 2040. And many kinds of cancers appear at different rates for different reasons in African cancer patients. It's important that we understand and can explain these reasons. Highlighted here are some examples such as African women diag are diagnosed with much higher rates of triple negative breast cancer compared to other ethnicities. Liver cancer rates are 24% higher in Africa compared to the United States. And prostate cancer is the leading cause of mortality in African men with a mortality to incidence ratio that's 274% higher in Africans than in North Americans. With this cancer crisis in mind, BBGH developed the African Access Initiative with five objectives to establish sustainable access to high quality and affordable cancer medicines and technologies, to strengthen healthcare infrastructure, build clinical oncology capacity, address the cancer data gap in Africa through clinical trials, and expand awareness of cancer in Africa. Partnerships are central to everything that we do. Working in Africa, we have signed agreements with six ministries of health, and we focus on, we focus our work in Kenya, Rwanda, Cameroon, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, and Senegal. And we also work across different partners in different sectors and many academic partners that are not listed here. All of our work through AAI is driven by Africa for Africa, 
And it starts working from the ground up with a hospital needs assessment to assess each hospital's priorities and to frame their specific needs. And this needs assessment collects data from the pan cancer patients that are presenting and diagnosed, types of cancers, stage of disease, and also assesses the treatment infrastructure and human resource capabilities across the cancer patient pathway, including um, gathering information about cancer research and clinical trials of interest. This slide um, highlights some of the training programs that we have conducted with partners. And it also highlights some of the types of training that um, we've been able to conduct, including in-person fellowships with fellows and experts from industry and academia um, placed in African countries at working alongside um, oncologists. And also in the top right corner, um, a, a pathology training workshop that was conducted with the American Society for Clinical Pathology. We's, we've also, over the last year and a half, um, conducted many virtual uh, training programs across specific cancer types and areas of treatment, such as radiotherapy. But I wanna turn um, my attention to the fact that African cancer patients are underrepresented in clinical trials, and there's a significant data gap in African ethnicities. Clinical trials present an opportunity to address issues of diversity um, because African patients have unique tumor genetics and biologies, and Africa is the most genetically diverse continent. Also, trials can help to address equity to treatment because clinical trials drive early access to cutting edge treatment and high quality care. And they also generate the data to understand that patients will respond to the regimens prescribed. And currently, less than 2% of, glo of global cancer clinical trials are performed in Africa and about 4% of patients enrolled in cancer clinical trials in 2018 were of African descent. So with this data gap and these opportunities in mind, we developed the African Consortium for Cancer Clinical Trials under the umbrella of AAI with the goals of addressing the cancer data gap in African ethnicities and increasing access to cancer medicines and technologies through clinical trials. Within AC3T, uh, we are building clinical trial capacity, promoting Africa's clinical trial capabilities, experiences, and priorities, catalyzing African investigator-initiated research, and driving transnational collaboration. Through AC3T, we start with a grounds up approach again by conducting a, an assessment of clinical trial sites readiness to perform clinical trials. And this is through what we refer to as our AC3T checklist, which gathers information um, in addition to the AAI needs assessment across the institution focused on specific infrastructure and human resources to conduct rigorous clinical trials. And those include um, assessments of regulatory and research ethics committees, um, the experience of conducting research and clinical studies, staffing resources, um, data management, financial management, and the ability to manage patient side effects effectively. And I just wanna highlight some of the uh, capacity building programs that have been conducted to date to build clinical trial readiness in sites. And these projects include um, partnerships with companies like Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Um, here, I've highlighted the Takeda Knowledge Exchange Program. This is a program that's been ongoing for more than two years between Takeda Pharmaceuticals and sites in, in Rwanda. And the program is both in, has taken place in person workshops and knowledge exchange, 
but over the last year and a half, it's been conducted virtually. And we've tapped into experts at Takeda across areas of clinical trial management to share skills and knowledge in areas of clinical trial design, protocol development, biostatistics, patient recruitment, budgeting, et cetera. And this program is designed to promote learning through actual practice. Um, we've also uh, conducted a uh, clinical trial, a clinical trial fellowship program with clinical trial experts from Merck, who spent three months in, um, in Kenya, working alongside the Ministry of Health and the National Cancer Control Program to develop and refine um, policies and best practices, as well as to conduct customized lectures to fill hospitals' clinical trial expertise gaps. Using the information gathered through the AAI uh, needs assessment and AC3T checklist, we designed a virtual multi-week, 14-week clinical trial training program that addressed topics that were prioritized by oncologists and researchers at hospitals. And this was a, um, this is a program that was conducted over 14 weeks. We had over 490 registrants representing 37 countries, um, 180 of the participants were awarded certificates and certificates were awarded based on participants um, participating in each of the 14 um, week training programs and also completing pre and post course surveys and submitting um, completed and weekly homework assignments that were developed by the, the um, expert, um, experts that, that developed the lectures. And we had experts from leading institutions that led sessions, both from industry and from academia. And topics covered including, included drug development process and clinical trial basics, uh, the conduct of phase one, two, three, and four clinical trials, principles of good, good clinical practice, protocol called design and statistical methods, research ethics, patient recruitment and communication, budgeting for clinical trials, and writing competitive grant applications. And we were really pleased to have Dr. Julie Graylow, um, of, uh, Chief Medical Officer of ASCO, speak at the graduation ceremony where the um, graduates were awarded certificates and to share some of her um, knowledge and experience about the importance of conducting clinical trials in Africa. We've worked with ASCO um, on a few capacity building programs. And I just wanna highlight one of the clinical trial e-courses that we conducted in partnership with ASCO's international team. And this is a program that was developed um, for specifically for Francophone Africa and it was held in French. And it was a six week electronic workshop. We had 38 participants um, representing Cote d'Ivoire, Rwanda and Senegal, and 15 attendees um, received certificates of completion from ASCO. The weekly sessions um, consisted of um, topics that had been prioritized um, by the uh, participants and were led by world-class experts. We had small um, breakout groups that were facilitated around specific topics. And each session um, included an African researcher led presentation, sharing some of their experiences and lessons learned um, through their research programs and partnerships. In addition to training programs and capacity building, uh, we also partner with organizations like the Society for Immunotherapy in Cancer um, on workshops so that they can better understand some of the gaps in sites in Africa and the interests in actually delivering immunotherapy to patients. And this is just on your left, uh, a workshop that SITSI held um, to better understand 
the interests of African sites and oncologists in delivering immunotherapy to patients. And then we also had the, um, the privilege of working with Professor Falake Odedina, who coordinated a series of publications in the Journal of Clinical Oncology about oncology clinical trials in Africa, where we worked with um, oncologists from Africa to publish some experiences and also to share some of our experience through AC3T. Um, here is a, an example and a, a screenshot of the AC3T platform. And we've built this platform to profile African clinical trial sites and the interests of these sites in conducting cancer clinical trials. And so this is a publicly available database that um, you can find on BBGH's website. We currently have about 50 African hospitals that are profiled. And as you can see, um, the information is um, is available to view and in your bottom left corner, you can also see looking at clinical trial information, hyperlinks to publications and to sites where clinical trial trials are, are posted. And these profiles include information about clinical trial experience and infrastructure, staffing capacity and diagnostic and hospital systems. Um, this is, I think this is a really valuable tool, both for African oncologists and researchers to promote their own interests in participating in clinical trials, but also importantly for companies and for academics to easily um, identify potential partner sites and de-risk their clinical trial site selection from their own offices at home before kind of diving into a deeper due diligence um, uh, assessment of a potential partner in Africa. And in addition to profiling the site's capabilities, we also are using the AC3T platform to profile and promote clinical investigators and their research capabilities and interests. Um, this is one of the researchers that we've been working with, Dr. Ashil Manira Kiza, who is a clinical radiation oncologist um, at King Faisal Hospital in Rwanda. And um, he has about three years of experience and is participating in a number of um, very interesting research studies right now, including a study that we're working on with him um, in prostate cancer, and also a cancer genetic study that he is working on with, um, with Dana, Dana Farber and Har Harvard um, researchers. So I just want to also walk you through how we are um, facilitating the experience for primary investigators in Africa. And we're doing this through uh, an AC3T study pool. And following the 14 week clinical trial training program, we announced a, an AC3T mini grant program um, that is available only to participants in the 14 week course. But these are very small grants to perform pilot studies on research questions with data that these researchers may already have or have access to, but that they're interested in studying and publishing. And this is an opportunity to practice new skills, gain during the course, and also to build some independent uh, cancer research leaders. Through the AC3T study pool, we've also funded a prostate cancer pilot study. And this is, this is a feasibility um, of a phase two drug study. This is Dr. Manira Kiza in Rwanda, and he is studying um, use of a drug in prostate cancer patients. Part of the AC3T study pool also includes um, mentored projects, which are projects that are conceived by the African PI, but they're partnered with an external mentor to help to co-develop the research project so that it will be publishable in a peer-reviewed journal and to support um, the researcher in developing the protocol 
the statistics and any other areas where assistance is, is requested. And some projects that are funded include digitization and retrospective studies of historical patient data, the evaluation of cancer, um, the cancer incidence over time, cancer data systems development and implementation of a national cancer registry. And then the last study that I'll highlight is um, a hypofractionation uh, radiotherapy study for prostate cancer patients. And this is a, will be a two year study involving 182 patients. And we have clinical trial sites that will be representing Nigeria and Tanzania participating in this study. And I'd like to close by just highlighting um, some of our upcoming uh, cancer patient um, or cancer uh, capacity building and training programs that span the cancer patient pathway. I'd like to thank everyone for your time and, and attention. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the introduction and uh, for inviting me to share FDA's perspective on international uh, clinical trials uh, with uh, focus on good clinical practice. My name is uh, Kasa Yalu. I'm um, the acting division director for uh, the division of clinical compliance evaluation with an office of scientific investigations at uh, Center for Drug Evaluation Research. Um, the views and uh, opinions presented here are mine. Uh, they do not represent uh, the US Food and Drug Administrations. During the next uh, few minutes after providing you with uh, general background on international clinical trials, uh, supporting regulatory submissions uh, for marketing approvals, I will be discussing about FDA's validation of data through uh, on-site inspection, including uh, the impact of GCP inspection findings on uh, regulatory submissions. Uh, before closing, I will be also talking about the impact of COVID-19 on international clinical trials, as well as uh, about uh, the existing GCP collaboration with uh, uh, foreign regulators. As uh, most of you know, the clinical development of medical products is a global undertaking, and uh, sponsors uh, do conduct clinical trials uh, globally to use their uh, data from those trials to support their marketing applications here in the United States. Regardless of where uh, sponsors conduct their clinical trials, FDA's determination on medical product approval depend uh, primarily on demonstration of safety and efficacy. Uh, likewise, it is also very important to have uh, reliable data uh, to um, have uh, FDA's determination of uh, drug approval T straight. Clinical trials are uh, conducted under investigational new drug application here in the United States. Uh, but they we can be also conducted under investigational uh, new drug application outside the United States. Uh, however, sponsors are not uh, required to conduct their clinical studies under uh, investigational new drug applications in order to use their data from this, uh, those studies uh, to support uh, their marketing applications for approval here in the United States. Regardless where uh, clinical studies are conducted, when studies are conducted under investigational new drug application, uh, they uh, must meet all the relevant FDA regulatory requirements. FDA, uh, um, the criteria for acceptance of foreign data from trials not conducted under IND. I mean, earlier we mentioned that sponsors can conduct their clinical studies uh, without IND outside the United States. Uh, but there are criteria for acceptance of uh, foreign data from trials you know, conducted under IND uh, that need to be made uh, if sponsors want to use that data for, uh, to support their marketing application 
uh, here in the United States. Uh, FDA accepts data from foreign studies not conducted under investigation on new drug if studies meet the following criteria specified in FDA's regulation. Uh, first is the studies must be well designed and conducted. And secondly, those studies must be performed by qualified investigators, i.e. Uh, qualified investigators by training and experience. Um, in order to accept the foreign data from studies not conducted under ND, FDA should be able to validate the data through on-site inspection if necessary as well. And uh, last but not least, those studies not conducted under IND and uh, presented to support marketing application in the US should be also conducted in accordance with uh, GCP principles. Distribution of uh, clinical studies on this uh, slide uh, is uh, shown both uh, the map and in, in the bar graph format. And uh, distribution of clinical studies uh, based on clinicaltrial.gov uh, show that most clinical studies that are currently regist registered in the database come from uh, regions such as North America, uh, Europe, and East Asia. And uh, the contribution from other regions appear to be uh, very limited. What are the objectives uh, of FDA validation of data through uh, inspection? Uh, first and foremost, the validation of the data through inspection is to verify the quality, the integrity, and the acceptability of data submitted to FDA to support the marketing application to claim uh, safety and um, efficacy uh, of an investigational product. It's also to ensure the adequacy of the protection of the rights and uh, welfare, as well as safety of study participants. Uh, the data validation also help to ensure that if they regulated uh, clinical researches are conducted in compliance with applicable regulations. Risk-based site cell, uh, we at CEDAR um, use a risk-based site selection tool to identify sites for inspection. The risk-based site selection for inspection takes into account uh, several factors when we identify uh, the sites that we would be conducting data validation. And um, those um, attributes include application label attributes, such as um, the submission type, whether the submission is for a new molecular entity or emergency use authorization or um, a submission to uh, address um, uh, medical needs of our special population, a targeted population. Or uh, we also look into the study level attributes as a submission may contain several studies. Uh, the focus of the inspection will be primarily on those that are uh, critical for decision-making, the pivotal studies. And um, at site level also, we do comparative uh, performance uh, indicators assessment uh, using uh, the tool. And uh, we compare uh, sites how they have done in terms of um, obtaining or reporting the information, safety or uh, efficacy related information to um, rank them for site selection. What are the criteria for conducting an inspection outside the United States? And um, clinical sites are likely to be audited when uh, submissions uh, contain insufficient domestic data or uh, only for if foreign data uh, are submitted to support regulatory submission. And uh, likewise, if you see any conflicting results pertinent to decision-making between the foreign and domestic data, we um, likely inspect those sites outside the country. And um, both for domestic and foreign inspection, um, any issue related to ethical development could play also a uh, role in, in selecting sites for inspection. If you see or if you come across suspicion of fraud or scientific misconduct 
or issues related to um, human subject protection, we may uh, issue an inspection assignment to do uh, data validation uh, outside the United States, even here in the US. What would be the impact of GCP inspection findings on regulatory submission? And um, depending on the scope and the nature of uh, those inspectional findings uh, identified uh, during data validation, um, an impact on review may occur. And um, additional inspection or additional information requests may be required to understand the conduct of the study and uh, to further review the quality of the data. And in rare instances, the impact uh, the inspection findings may result and requiring additional studies or a leading uh, application to be to become non -up approved, and um, therefore it's very important to, to ensure that clinical studies are conducted according to regulatory expectations. What are the impact of COVID nineteen on international uh, clinical trials? The impact um, on clinical trial. Um, by COVID uh, can be divided into two. One is uh, the conduct of the clinical studies had been impacted across the board uh, globally. And as COVID pandemic delayed distribution of investigational products from one place to another, uh, cancellation of uh, visits, protocol specified visits resulting in protocol violations and uh, delay in the cancellation of uh, obtaining uh, pre-specified uh, procedures by protocol. And um, in addition to its impact on uh, conduct of clinical studies, uh, COVID-19 has also uh, put a lot of challenges on the way regulators uh, provide oversight to those clinical trials. Uh, as a result of the pandemic, um, uh, inspection planning uh, had been changed and inspection had been canceled or postponed uh, because of the travel restriction, quarantine, and um, uh, regional regional uh, restrictions are intended to prevent or to control uh, the dissemination of uh, the pandemic. And uh, that has impacted also the, our inspectional planning as well as uh, effort. Um, as stated before, we do have international GCP collaboration that has been going on for almost uh, over a decade. Uh, FDA collaborates uh, with foreign regulators uh, in many areas, uh, but uh, the focus here is just to give you a glimpse of uh, uh, activities related to GCP collaboration we have at uh, Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. We collaborate with um, uh, foreign regulators such as AMA and EU, MHR of UK, uh, PMD of Japan, and uh, Health Canada uh, on GCP issues. The purpose of uh, the collaboration is uh, primarily to share information related to uh, an inspection for important application we uh, commonly share. It's also to conduct collaborative inspection for shared marketing applications that allow uh, exchange of expertise and skills uh, between uh, and inspectors from different regulatory agencies. The take home point uh, for my uh, presentation is uh, wherever clinical trials are conducted, it is important to have clinical development programs that reliably produce high quality data acquired in an ethical manner. I think this is my last slide and um, have a couple of references for you that you can look at your leisure. First one is on FDA's acceptance of foreign clinical studies not conducted under IND, uh, frequently asked uh, uh, questions, um, uh, guidance that uh, got published in uh, 2012. And uh, the second reference is on FDA's BIMO compliance program that is intended to provide you uh, additional clarification about the BIMO compliance programs. And uh, if you have questions, uh, you may send your questions to me at the email provided at the bottom of this slide. Thank you very much for your attention.
We're not getting the audio. You're not? He's on. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, to the organizers of this conference for inviting IOTIC to talk on strengthening cancer clinical trials network in Africa, the IOTIC Clinical Trials Initiative. I am Dr. Bello, the president of IOTIC. Um, when we talk of clinical trials, one will look at the incidence of cancer around the globe and the possible um, increase in cancer by 2040. You will see that um, on this graph that Africa is projected to have a hundredfold increase by 2040. And this may not be unrelated to so many of the questions that will be raised here. Uh, so um, let's quickly look at the overview of clinical trials that it affects Sub-Saharan Africa. It's an emergent field in Sub-Saharan Africa and it's not adequately represented. And uh, so um, we will require you know, um, clinical trials to determine the safety and effectiveness of our treatments because most of the clinical trials for safety and effectiveness of treatments are not conducted in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we do realize also that the lowest number of clinical trials are conducted around the globe are reported in Africa, less than 3%. And there are a combination of so many factors that actually militate against uh, clinical trials in Sub-Saharan Africa. Looking at the current active clinical trials in Sub-Saharan Africa, you realize that of the 54 countries in Africa, only 20 currently host clinical trials active clinical trials. And those countries are mostly found in North Africa, 
in Egypt, especially in South Africa, Algeria, and now in Kenya. So the total number of active clinical trials being recorded at this point is only about 109. Even though in some data you will see that uh, there are over a thousand clinical trials being conducted in Sub-Saharan Africa. But the active clinical trials that are being conducted basically are 109. And these are in most of the common cancers, breast cancer, cervical cancer, and now um, prostate cancer with very few uh, lung cancer. Let me have some here to say that lung cancer is not a common disease in sub-Saharan Africa, even though we have few um, clinical trials. Looking at the distribution of the clinical trials, you will see that Egypt, that is way up here, has about 663 clinical trials being conducted, and South Africa has 465. The combination of just these two uh, countries account for more than 50% of the remaining um, 52 African countries. So in other words, there is little or no clinical trials in most of the sub-Saharan African countries. You will see that some countries don't have at all the presence of clinical trials. And this account for over 20, uh, over 50% of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So you look at the distribution uh, of clinical trial as per clinicaltrials.gov, you will see that Africa account for only 3% of the total clinical trials being conducted around the world. North America alone has over 44% and Europe our next door neighbors have about 28%. And this has to change because otherwise the narrative will continue to be gloomy. So looking at the date, the real uh, numbers, Africa has 1,259, while um, Europe has 22,700. So we account for less than 10% uh, of the European um, uh, clinical trials that have been conducted. So looking at all those data, we, we in um, IOTIC decided to look at the creation of an ABLE research committee. And one of the vision is to make IOTIC the premium organization for cancer research in Africa. And our mission, the mission statement of that research committee is to reduce cancer morbidity and mortality in Africa by facilitating high impact, innovative and collaborative research programs, enhancing research capacity and promoting the dissemination of scientific discoveries in Africa. Our core values are Afrocentric, clinical relevance, inclusiveness, collaboration, and much more. So what are the goals? So we stand on five fundamental goals. The first is the research agenda. We must develop a strong research agenda that will impact cancer outcome in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we must create funding, developing a model to raise and provide research funding for the African investigators is key to developing clinical trials in Sub-Saharan Africa. We must also develop research infrastructures, collaborate and have resources. So by establishing and extending research infrastructures and collaboration and building capacity based on existing uh, resources within and outside Africa. So we want the brain drain in Sub-Saharan Africa to be turned into brain gain, where we will collaborate not only with other international communities, but also Africans in the diaspora. We are also looking at dissemination of the African research. This is by way of fostering the, the um, by way of scientific conferences, fair review journals, traditional media, as well as social media. And lastly, we have developed special interest groups. So this is to establish strategies to improve cancer research through diverse special interest groups which will include advocacy, data science, cancer epidemiology, clinical trials, 
psycho-oncology outcomes and behavior. We have conducted an expo last, um, last couple of months on the special interest groups. So strengthening the clinical trials through collaboration will allow us to reach out to like-minded organizations and we are already collaborating with the NCI, the AACR, ASCO, as well as having dialogues with international pharma to see how clinical trials can actually be conducted in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the Confluence project is also very close to our heart. So what are the challenges that we have faced or we are still facing? Uh, the first is the lower priority for research, but already this is being, being addressed. Uh, I'm happy to note that most of the African countries have recognized the importance of research and uh, providing funding. Just about a few months ago, the Central Bank of Nigeria has appropriated amount of money that will be used as grant for research. And a lot of our investigators are reaching out to that grant. So also is um, other institutional um, organizations that are involved with tertiary institutions. We have also recognized the lack of dedicated research teams that meet international good clinical practice. So in other words, we have to develop capacity to understand the need for good clinical trials based on international uh, guidelines. So we know that, yes, we have unreliable access to the internet as well, and that is also ad addressed. But primarily, inadequate funding and lack of infrastructures are some of the key things that IOTIC is seriously trying to address, and we have started addressing it. So what are the solutions? Like I said, increasing funding for clinical trials, capacity building of dedicated research teams, prioritizing the need for clinical trials in Africa, and teletrials for African population, Afrocentric trials protocols, and patient involvement and engagement. We have recruited a lot of patient advocates and have gone to governments and PERMA and what have you to make sure that people understand and are ready to be involved in clinical trials. We are also trying to see how we can get investment in technologies to improve efficacy, power supply, internet uh, services, and so on and so forth. And then of course, we want to partnership with institutions in high income countries by reaching out to organizations such as the AADV and ASCO and AACR, BVGH and the rest. So I cannot conclude my presentation without inviting you to the biggest IOTIC, um, uh, biggest conf cancer conference in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the IOTIC conference that comes up between the 5th and the 10th of October of, of November this year, and it's virtual. Doctors, healthcare institutions, healthcare practitioners, private sectors and government, academia and researchers will all be there. So it is my hope and believe that you will join us. I thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you.
So I'd like to thank all the speakers for a series of outstanding talks. We welcome your questions and we'll hold them for the speakers till the end. Uh, they have kindly joined our panel. And we'll turn now to our panel discussion to take a deeper dive into the clinical trials in Africa. We're delighted to have a wide variety of stakeholders present who will be speaking during our panel discussion and open to, to your questions. So I would like to introduce the, the remaining members of the panel. Dr. Folakimi Odedina, Chair of the Aortic Research Committee. Dr. Chitkala Kalvidis, Vice President and Head of Oncology Regulatory Affairs at Bayer Pharmaceuticals. Dr. Jamie Friedman, Head of US Medical Affairs at Genentech. Dr. Moji Christiana Adeyeye, Director General of the Nigerian National Agency for Food and Drug Administration. Dr. Tia Norman from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who heads the Design, Analyze, and Communicate program. Dr. Lola Fashoyan Ajay, Deputy Division Director for the Oncology Center of Excellence at the US FDA. Dr. Jackson Oram, Director of the Uganda Cancer Institute and Co-Chair of the African Cancer Coalition. And Gertrude Nakaguti, Chief Executive Officer of Uganda Women's Cancer Support Organization. So welcome to the panel and we look, look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. As you can see, we have an exciting uh, lineup. Um, just in the interest uh, of background noise, if um, we could mute our microphones, except um, when we're talking, uh, that would be terrific. So I'm going to kick off the panel discussion um, by asking a few questions of Dr. Odedina, um, who is the chair, uh, as Bill has said, of the Aortic Research Committee. And um, we're thrilled to have you join us. Um, the first question for you is, um, um, tell us a little bit more. We just heard a great presentation for Dr. Bella, but do you want to augment a little bit on the Aortic Research Committee and in particular, the Clinical Trials Special Interest Group to support cancer clinical trials in Africa? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is such a great pleasure to be amongst this uh, really great panel. And I bring greetings from uh, AOTIC, especially the research committee. Uh, you know, one of the things that AOTIC really focuses on, and, and for a lot of people that may not know what AOTIC is, and I think Dr. Dr. Bello uh, presented really a rich uh, background, AOTIC's focus and goal is really to be able to develop and facilitate the implementation of outstanding research as well as education and training activities that focuses on cancer. So when you think about the Aortic Research Committee, our charge from, from the president, uh, from President Bello, is to provide that scientific direction uh, for us to be able to facilitate outstanding research that is really Afrocentric that is culturally responsive, and that has the values that is integrated in Africa. And so we work with five different pillars that uh, includes um, providing the research direction, um, infrastructure and resources, facilitating uh, uh, the research that is going on. And one of the active areas that we have, of course, is clinical trials. And this active area is just because as has been um, um, well said by, by the multiple presenters, we just have a death of clinical trials in Africa. And I think it is leading to failures of therapies. I think this is one of the things that I, maybe I didn't hear down in the presentation. Um, as, as the chair of Aortic Research Committee, I've had the distinct pleasure of traveling across Africa. And when you think about the different therapies and you think about the different clinical evidence, a lot of people are failing the cancer therapies and people are wondering why are they failing? 
Yes, they are failing because the clinical trials is not being done in the population. I really think, you know, and this is not a popular uh, opinion, but I've been doing this for 30 years. And within the last, I've been involved in aortic for over a decade. One of the things that we see in aortic that really, really saddens us is the idea that people feel that okay to bring the therapies to Africa and just look at it from the, uh, you know, uh, uh, from the post-marketing surveillance and not even in this age of personalized medicine, in this age of cancer genomics and not even see whether this is that, that populations of African ancestry will be very responsive. And this is also considering that even within, um, you know, um, high resource countries like the United States, we still don't have a high population of African ancestry participating in the study. So we are literally disseminating it. So what is aortic doing? So the chart that we have, we probably would say that aortic actually has a special interest group that focuses on clinical trials. And what is the charge of the special interest group? It has to do with training. So we've put in a lot of training programs and I think some of those have been mentioned. In addition to that, we, uh, we, we partner with um, a lot of organizations that includes organizations that have been mentioned today, but I also want to highlight one of the organizations that AOTIC is, is really partnering with is the African Clinical Trials Consortium. And the African Clinical Trials Consortium actually has received funding uh, from NCI to create centers of clinical trial excellence. One thing that I really love about that partnership between Africa, uh, between AOTIC, and that consortium is the idea that we are really taking a, 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 an environmental scan of Africa. And we are asking ourselves, where are the studies being conducted? And this is published. So we have published where the studies are being conducted. AOTIC also has partnered with multiple organizations to develop a platform that really showcases where the trials are in Africa, right? And for investigators to be able to go on that platform and also upload the platform. But much more importantly, we want to figure out where are the trials being conducted? What do they need to strengthen those trials? And how can we create centers of excellence in order to be able to do this? So this is kind of one of the key things. And lastly, I would have to mention that, and I'm not going to mention the, the pharma, but I am very pleased that quite a number of pharma have actually reached out to AOTIC to really be be begin the dialogue of what can we do? How can we support? What are the things that are missing? How can we move forward toward, you know, strong clinical trials in Africa? Quite a number of this we're going to be doing. Uh, I saw Dr. Bello invited, invited you to, um, uh, to our conference, but I also want to invite you especially to the aortic clinical trial special interest group, which is going to be taking place during the, the, the conference as well. We have a lot to do um, and we will get there. Great. And we saw from Dr. Bello's map that there are clinical trials going on in Africa, but the bulk of them are in South Africa and Egypt. Um, can, you've done a survey. Are there examples of some large scale industry trials um, that are being done in the region outside of Egypt and South Africa that you can point out or that you found in your survey? Uh, in our survey, which is published in the Journal of Global Oncology, no, unfortunately. And one of the things that is actually very interesting about our survey is that when we took a look at the patterns and where the clinical trials are being done, they are mostly institutional funded trials. A majority of the institutions are from the United States. So majority of the trials that we are actually documenting in Africa are funded by US institutions. What you see in Egypt also is a very interesting pattern. In Egypt, majority of those, study, of those studies are actually funded by Egyptian institutions. So again, you know, you are seeing the pattern, we're not seeing a lot of wide scale, you know, based on the, on, on the, on the survey that we did, we, had, we did not see a lot of wide scale industry funded trials. What we were seeing were institutionally funded trials, mostly US institutions who are partnering with colleagues in Africa. And this is not really a bad trend, to be honest with you. And I think this may be an opportunity for pharma to really collaborate with maybe institutions in the United States who already are creating the infrastructure at these institutions in Africa and to be able to then have those trials done in there. Um, so, 
you know, unfortunately, we we are not where we need to be. Um, you know, so hopefully things would would, would take a one or two degrees time for the better. Thanks so much, Dr. Odadina. And as you mentioned, having pharma partnerships is so critical. And I'd like to turn to the industry pr perspective and ask Dr. Kalidas a question. Uh, Bayer has done a lot of trials in India. And so can you speak about lessons learned there that may be applicable to Africa or, or other approaches that you would, you would recommend from the experience that you've had, please? Yes, I'm happy to share Bayer's experience with uh, clinical trials in India uh, that are relevant to the discussion today, because I do see some parallels between where India was at the time when um, clinical trials were starting to go to India um, compared to where uh, we are right now. Um, Bayer currently has global clinical trials ongoing in India. Uh, we had recently re-entered India to conduct clinical research. And I have to say that in the case of India, I should really go back to the late 1990s and early 2000s when pharma companies first considered India to be a good choice for conducting clinical trials because of the key benefits that um, India offers in terms of um, clinical research. And these benefits would include um, the high quality of medical expertise in India, the large patient population, the ability to enroll patients quickly, um, and um, the availability of hospitals and medical centers that can support patient care as well as the conduct of clinical trials in compliance with uh, GCP. While there were these clear benefits and these benefits still exist, um, companies like Bayer still have to do their assessment on, I would say, four key topics. The first is, of course, the ability to conduct global clinical trials in the target disease with complete adherence to GCP and the highest levels of ethics, quality, and compliance that are applicable to all sites participating in a global clinical trial, as well as understanding the regulatory landscape in India. So I would say that is the component number one. Um, the second one is an assessment of market access capabilities and patterns. And the third is an assessment of the commercial go-to model. Uh, and finally, an assessment of um, intellectual property protection, um, legal and compliance assessment as well. So if there is a good fit between a specific program and the assessment results in positive um, results, then it, you know, it's a good fit for that particular program to conduct clinical trials in India. So we have conducted these assessments and um, conducted clinical trials, and we also have Bayer Oncology Drugs approved in India. Um, we have a policy that um, if we conduct clinical trials in a particular country, then we will make our drug available via registration in that country. So that's a very important requirement. So we don't just go in to do the clinical trials and then make an exit. So we have to really understand the full path from clinical trials to market access, commercial model, and of course, as part of it, the legal and compliance aspects. So all four components are extremely important before we can make a decision um, to actually conduct a clinical trial. So I, I would highlight that that is one important learning. Um, the second learning is while the benefits that a particular country offers, like in the case, uh, in this case, India offers are generally well understood within a company at a high level, it was really important, especially in the early days, for us to have a local expert and we relied on external clinical research experts in India who were able to act as a liaison between the sites and the investigators in India and our clinical research operations and regulatory teams at Bayer to help us select the appropriate sites and also to sort of translate what we are looking for in terms of just consistency in, in adherence to GCP and compliance and so on. And the third learning is that it really helps when there is support from key decision makers in a company to try something that is novel and have a global view of drug development. Um, and in our case, um, our head of clinical development is someone who has been conducting clinical trials in India since the 1990s and has um, a very good appreciation of what India can offer in terms of all the benefits and actually has experienced 
um, those benefits uh, firsthand. So these are, um, I would say, the key learnings from our experience doing con um, trials in India. Great, oh, thanks. So, and, uh, so if you had, just, just as a kind of a blue sky question, if the key decision makers at Bayer said, we want to go to Africa, we want to start there, what, what would you start? How would you start that? What, what would be your first steps of getting that going, please? Um, I would say just um, the, the assessment of the four components that I mentioned is as a framework, it's going to be important. But I also think there is an opportunity to break the ice. When I said um, there was this liaison who helped us understand uh, and also select the appropriate sites and, and helped us through uh, the four components that are important before we make a decision to go in. I think, um, you know, an icebreaker exercise to make that happen could be a panel like this um, that conducts maybe a CEO roundtable. That is one option. Or working directly with the experts. Like, for example, um, Jennifer Dent shared what her organization does and uh, Dr. Abu Baker um, and Dr. Um, Odadina also shared the capabilities of their organization, it's really finding that partner for us who can be the translator or the liaison between you know, the company as well as the local sites and help them understand our requirements along the four components and um, you know, identify where there may be hurdles or gaps and help fill those, those gaps. But I would also like to add one more component besides the four, the, the clinical and regulatory piece, the market access, the commercial and the legal piece, there is a fifth piece which really should not be overlooked. And that is the ability of a pharma company to participate in capacity building in Africa. Dr. Abu Bakr brought up the, the challenges. And I do think in a pre-competitive manner, um, we can, make some um, changes there or improvements there, which can ultimately lead to a positive outcome along those four components. For example, Bayer has an initiative ongoing in, in Ghana. We have both um, an oncology initiative that we have recently started and a cardiovascular initiative that has been ongoing for um, uh, much longer, where we focus on capacity building. And in the case of the oncology initiative, we focus on capacity building for cancer screening. And by engaging with leading institutions in target countries, we can understand what their needs are, where in a pre-competitive um, basis, we can address those gaps and sustainability and corporate responsibility. Those are big goals for every pharma company and uh, really has the attention of the key decision makers. So this is what I would say, focusing on engaging with local experts and also not forgetting the, the sustainability angle to really bringing about improvements in access to quality cancer care. Thank thanks you, for those, yeah. Thank, thanks Love the term icebreaker. Yeah, those great ideas. I'm envisioning a CEO roundtable. maybe uh, Aortic uh, could uh, arrange that in conjunction with your meeting and bring uh, industry representatives interested in this uh, to the table. So let's continue on the industry theme. Um, we also have with us Dr. Jamie Friedman from Genentech. Um, Dr. Friedman, Genentech has made a strong commitment to equity domestically uh, in the US. Can you tell us about your global efforts in this area? Yeah, thanks very much, Julie. And Genentech is the US subsidiary of Roche, which is a global pharmaceutical company. And as you know, um, historically, uh, clinical trials uh, typically uh, ha have very low numbers of underrepresented minorities in, in clinical trials, particularly in the pivotal clinical trials that are primarily white. Um, last year during the pandemic, uh, we, we decided to change all that with um, a, a phase three trial that we conducted to assess the risk benefit of an old drug called Actemra for rheumatoid arthritis for the treatment of COVID-19 pneumonia. This is a randomized phase three trial uh, that was conducted primarily in the US and the approach we took was to go to underserved communities to enrich minority patients. And this was not this is not the traditional approach that pharma companies do because they typically go to the tried and true large academic centers where there's a primarily white population. And by going to underserved communities, as a company, we were taking a risk because we don't know if we're able to recruit or what the quality of the data is gonna be um, or if there's gonna be compliance issues. And so we started going around the country to various sites starting in the Bronx and Queens in New York. And then um, 
we eventually expanded into South America and also Africa. And we chose uh, South Africa because South Africa has been part of many clinical trials before, but we also decided to go to Kenya, um, who's never been part of a global clinical trial at Roche. Um, we enrolled that trial extremely rapidly, um, and uh, it was actually the fastest enrolling trial we've ever done um, at Roche. And by the end of it, we had enrolled 85% minorities. So 55% were Hispanic Latinx, 17% um, were African American and, Af and uh, patients of African descent, and 12.5% were Native Americans, which is notoriously underrepresented on clinical trials. Um, the trial ended up being a positive trial because we showed we could reduce the progression to mechanical ventilation by 44%. And this trial uh, eventually led to emergencies authorization for Ectemra in the United States. And that allows us to be able to uh, promote the drug for underserved communities in the US. Um, subsequent to that, this really launched us in the foray of inclusive research. So we started a new trial with our frontline therapy for multiple sclerosis called Ocrevus, which is approved in the US. Um, and we're doing a dedicated inclusive research trial in black patients who typically have more severe multiple sclerosis. So we really wanted to understand how they respond to Ocrevus. And we also included Kenya to continue the momentum that we started with the previous clinical trial for COVID-19, because we wanna to continue to keep adding new African sites to our trials. We also have plans for oncology trials to, uh, between the US and Africa um, in the future. So what do you see, Dr. Friedman, that it would take for Genentech Roche to actually include the African sites in your oncology trials specifically? Yeah. So um, in the past, um, you know, most African countries did not have uh, robust regulatory frameworks in place, raising questions and concerns around quality, patient safety, and data integrity. And in 2016, Roche Sub -Saharan, the Roche Sub-Saharan African Leadership Team started a five-year plan for conducting oncology clinical trials in, in Africa. And 2019 provided significant insights on how to do these studies and to build the infrastructure needed so clinical operations could be successfully deployed. Uh, the current list of Roche Genentech studies currently taking place in Africa is really long and growing um, in 2021. Outside of South Africa, routinely at, who are routinely added to global clinical trials, there are 14 global studies for oncology currently in many other countries, including Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Kenya, Uganda, uh, and Nigeria participating in, um, in global oncology clinical trials. And we're evalu evaluating the expansion into Ghana and Tanzania as well as additional countries. Uh, this, country, uh, this country list will grow in our five-year plan as we scale up R&D activities on the continent. And just in addition to that, we talked about like global phase three clinical trials. Genentech's 2025 vision is to include Africa in early phase studies right from the beginning stages of a molecules development. We've already begun a proposal to conduct uh, feasibility for a phase one study in Kenya for lung and colorectal cancer. And then there's the Genentech Advancing Inclusive Research Community of Practice, which includes Roche team members from Africa in our pipeline planning for clinical studies. And finally, Genentech Site Alliance model supports less experienced research centers in the US, and we're adding African sites as well that have the necessary skills and capacity to take on even more studies on the continent. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Friedman. So let's shift to the regulatory side next. And I have a question for, for uh, Director General Adeyeye. So what, what is your vision for NAFDAC and, and how do clinical trials play into that vision in, in your country and in, and in Africa, please? Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this very important uh, meeting. Uh, of course, the vision for NAPDAC as a regulatory agency is uh, to safeguard the health of the population. Uh, the vision of NAPDAC is to be uh, strong enough in terms of regulatory system strengthening to make clinical trials uh, much easier than what it is right now. Uh, Dr. Odedina mentioned the fact that uh, we don't have, and uh, also Dr. Bello, uh, that we don't have enough of uh, 
we don't even have much of clinical trials going on in terms of oncology. And it's not just oncology, it's other uh, disease states too, or other drugs. Uh, it is because generally the regulatory system is weak. You cannot spin a gold out of hay. And many of us now, uh, at least in Africa, many of uh, regulatory agencies are going through global benchmarking, auditing is a WHO, global benchmarking, and clinical trial is one of the very important uh, regulatory functions uh, for which they audit us or for which they assess what we are doing. And uh, it has a lot of recommendations that we have to meet. Uh, so aside from the breaking of the ice, the regulatory system must be very strong. The South Africa, in terms of regulatory system, uh, it's not, it's, you cannot say regulatory system is stronger in South Africa than Ghana, because the index of, uh, of uh, assessment of uh, strength of regulatory system based on this EU global benchmarking, Ghana has maturity level three, South Africa doesn't yet. But because the traffic has been uh, to South Africa for a long time, it is not surprising. But uh, even the regulatory system, it doesn't pan out in terms of where people, where uh, sponsors go. But in terms of sustainability, it is extremely important that the regulatory system is very strong. NAVDAC is working towards that. We are about to get to that level. Uh, and it has taken us about three and a half years. Uh, I was talking with Jennifer Dent, uh, uh, maybe last year or two years ago before the pandemic, in terms of emphasis on clinical trials of new molecules coming into Africa. There are many things that are going on, the suitcase, suitcase uh, clinical trial sponsors. They don't even go through NAVDAC. We just find out as after thought or after event or whatever, they don't go through NAVDAC, but it is also because NAVDAC was weaker at that point. Now that we are getting stronger, uh, we want to be sure that clinical trials, also the, the traffic uh, flows into Nigeria. For example, we now have the ECTAP or clinical trial application platform uh, it's, it's, it was sponsored by uh, Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, where all clinical trial sponsors can apply. And we are working now with NREC. We have a kind of strange system in Nigeria where you have the ethics uh, on one side and then the approval group side, on, on, usually it's supposed to be in the US, uh, uh, the institutional review board is combination of both ethics and approval, you know, uh, or review rather. So uh, we are working with NREC to ensure that all clinical trial applications should go through this ECTAP. Uh, so in terms of vision, of course, is safeguarding the health of our people. And what we are now changing in our own organization is that any new molecule that is coming in into our country must go through clinical trial uh, study, if it is, it may be active, observational, or whatever, uh, because the genetic polymorphism is there. What we work for African Americans will not may not work for Africans in Nigeria. Talking of breaking of the ice and the round table, we have what is called AU three S uh, steering committee. It's funded by BMGF, Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, and it is for COVID. We are starting with COVID. And what we are doing now is compiling data, safety monitoring uh, of COVID vaccines in four African countries, Ghana, Nigeria, Ethiopia, and South Africa. And to see whether there are even ethnic differences, not to talk of uh, intercontinental differences. So that is why it is extremely important uh, to focus on Africa or more countries in Africa, because focusing on clinical trials in Africa, is it makes good business sense. 
if you focus, if, if you have good clinical trial data and it's favorable, of course, the drug will sell. If not, the drug may not sell. And we are getting stronger as a regulatory agency uh, to ensure that clinical trials are done in Nigeria. So one of the problems was our weakness in the past that we, have, we are overcoming now. And also the fact that there is no CRO, private business, uh, con, you know, that's a, a private company that is uh, focusing on clinical trials. Uh, Dr. Bello and uh, Dr. Bello was right on the mark in terms of funding, poor infrastructure. Uh, the government has realized that they have neglected health sector for a long time and now uh, putting money into R&D, including clinical trials. But the basic capacity building has to be there. And this is where this breaking of the ice collaboration with IOTIC, with uh, AADB, uh, very important. Over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic. It's great uh, to hear what Nigeria is doing in the regulatory arena. And I, I love all of your comments. Hope to get back to some discussion uh, a little later in the panel. Let's um, turn, um, you, you brought up your relationship with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We have Dr. Taya Norman here um, representing uh, their Design, Analyze, Communicate program that you participated in. Um, welcome, uh, Dr. Norman. Tell us a little bit more about what this Design, Analyze, Communicate program is, and in particular, your partnership with the Nigerian FDA um, in converting data to electronic form. How can this help us um, facilitate clinical trials in Africa? Thank you, Julie, um, and great to see you, Emoji, on the screen. Um, let me tell you about the DAP program. This is the Foundation's Design, Analyze, Communicate program. And this consists of some internal clinical study review services, trial planning grants, and these are paired with external partnerships, such as the one that we have with NAFDAC and also public goods on our public website. The mission of the DAC program at the foundation is to help our, our disease area program teams and their grantees apply the best science and tools for their clinical study planning. DAC's internal services ensure that more of our foundation funded studies end with an informative outcome and that more confident decisions can be made in the shortest period of time with the least amount of human and financial resources. This means we get to the clear answers we need to help save and improve more lives on the global platform. As a part of developing our clinical study protocol review process, and with the eruption of COVID-19 in early 2020, our DAC team developed a digitized review platform and process. We started off by using our digitized platform to review COVID-19 protocols submitted for funding to the foundation and made our way through about 40 clinical study protocol reviews in three months. Since then, we've been using this portal to review protocols and study synopses for all of the disease areas that the foundation funds. DAC's protocol review process is based on a set of so-called best practices. And these are research methods um, that are common um, in the pharmaceutical industry, but needed in global health at the clinical trial sites that you all have been speaking of. We also developed a questionnaire that we call our DAC assessment tool. And this covers the key areas of study planning that we focus on when we cover design, analyze, and communicate in our questionnaire. Turning to NAFDAC, our partnership with the Nigerian FDA started with us wondering if our DAC best practices and our assessment tool questionnaire, when integrated into a digitized review platform, could be helpful for African regulators in their own review of clinical study protocols. To answer this question, we partnered with Director General Moji and NAFDAC to build a digitized review platform that meets their requirements. As a part of this, the NAFDAC team looked at our best practices and our set of review questions. And from that, they customized a set of best practices and an assessment questionnaire for their use case as regulators. This was integrated into a digitized electronic review platform for NAFDAC that also includes other processes that they need to accept, review, and approve clinical studies run in Nigeria. 
And at that platform serves to convert what was previously a snail mail and paper-based review process into a faster and more transparent digitized approach. Clinical study investigators can log into NAFDAQ's platform and complete their study application. And reviewers will be able to use the platform to access clinical study documents and complete their review. Thank you. That's that's great. Great program and great to see the, the interactions that you, you have, have going on. And next, I, I would like to turn to the U.S. regulatory perspective to Dr. Fishoyan Ajay. So we've, we've had, we've been discussing in, in trying to get more diversity in clinical trials in the United States. You personally have been involved in a lot of those, those efforts. And so is Africa a way that we can, can increase diversity? And at the same time, we've also heard from Director General Adyeye about the, the will that our populations in Africa are gonna be representative populations in, in America. We have a, a question uh, from the audience about that. So what, what are your thoughts? I mean, is, is uh, uh, can we extend efforts to improve diversity outside the United States, please? Um, yes, so thank you so much for the invitation to participate in this program. All the talks have been really wonderful. I think to, to answer that question, I think it's worth kind of briefly revisiting really why we advocate for diversity and uh, specifically the inclusion of subgroups that have uh, historically been underrepresented in clinical research. Uh, this includes groups that are defined by demographic factors like race, ethnicity, age, and, and so forth, but also based on clinical characteristics. And so we know that patients in the U.S., uh, who have comorbidities tend to be excluded uh, from clinical trial participation, even as they are uh, sort of overrepresented, uh, obviously, among uh, people who have the disease, right? Um, and we know that patients with comorbidities are uh, disproportionately represented uh, in, in the racial and ethnic minority uh, groups. So, you know, the way we accomplish diversity uh, for clinical characteristics uh, is really by examining the eligibility criteria. And we've done a lot of work in this space with ASCO and, and Friends of Cancer Research and others uh, over a number of years. And we also obviously look at the demographic factors uh, and you know, they may range in terms of how good they are uh, serving as proxies for the thing that we're really interested in, which is genetic uh, diversity, which is what we, we, we talked about um, here um, in, in some of the talks. Um, so really the overall goal is to try to achieve better alignment of the clinical and demographic factors at baseline of the trial population uh, with the population that eventually will receive the drug once it's approved. And this is really to ensure that the results of the trials are generalizable and extrapolatable to a broader population. So it's not about sort of this race or that race, it's really to try to get the underlying diversity in variability of presentation of the disease, but also in variability in response to therapies that we're trying to achieve. So we don't really view um, diversity that extends to uh, global sites as antithetical to the efforts that we're um, uh, promoting uh, within the United States. And I think, you know, as, as many of the speakers um, discussed, it's no secret that an overwhelming majority of uh, oncology trials um, uh, that are designed to support F FDA regulatory action are global trials. Uh, less than 2% of the, the, the trials are conducted uh, exclusively in the United States. Um, and it's also no secret that participants from certain demographic subgroups, uh, Blacks, Hispanics, um, some Asian uh, populations, um, older adults are underrepresented in these trials. Um, relative to their representation, again, among cases uh, who have the disease or the condition. And so when we have taken a look at the United States and looked at the U.S. sites in these global trials, um, on average, about 20 to 25 percent of participants in these global trials come from the United States or enrolled in U.S. sites. Um, and the range can be as low as 10 percent uh, to just uh, under 40 percent in some trials. And when we look at the proportion of Blacks, as an example, um, approximately 2 to 5% uh, of the participants in these cl clinical trials are Blacks. And uh, it's a little bit higher number if you're just looking at US sites, 
but um, I think you can see that that, that is a gross underrepresentation. And this is the same across other uh, demographic subgroups. And so really as the US FDA, while our primary interest is really ensuring that the medical products that we are approving are adequately characterizing the safety and effectiveness in um, a population that reflects um, the diversity of the United States, we have to think about diversity in the context of global clinical trials. There's no avoiding that. Um, so in our view, diversity and global clinical trials, as I said, they are not antithetical. Um, and certainly when you think about, um, you know, the fact that currently less than 1% of the trial participants are enrolled in the United States in the data that we've looked at um, in oncology and about 3% of the population comes from South America. And then you kind of look at the, the populations within the United States that are underrepresented in the clinical research, including in clinical trials, you can see that you're not really optimizing um, really the opportunities to, to get um, more information uh, uh, and to learn more about these drugs that we approve and also the drugs. So really to answer the question, I think we need to talk about uh, take a look at diversity and um, in a prospective manner. And I think um, uh, we heard that uh, earlier, not really retrospectively uh, when the trial is completed, not just for the pivotal clinical trials, but really early, even as early as in the candidate drug selection, where you may be selecting drugs on the basis of you know, biomarkers that may be enriched in certain populations versus others to really kind of uh, address that unmet need for therapies that work in a specific subgroup of, of, of patients that may be uh, more regionally distributed in one place uh, compared to another. And I think this really needs to be addressed in a non-competitive and very collaborative uh, way in order not only to get the access that we talked about, the breaking of the ice, but also to ensure sustainability. So we don't wanna have these kind of one-off experiences. We did this in this one drug and we did this in this one country, but really we wanna have a sustained approach. So we view our, our efforts to promote diversity and, uh, and inclusivity to be really uh, more broad than just kind of specific subgroups. It's really trying to get that variability and to optimize the opportunities for learning. Fantastic overview. Uh, I love hear, hearing you say we need to think about clinical trials in the global context and also the whole, it's not a one and done kind of thing. This is going to take a concerted effort and we want this to be sustainable. So um, I'd actually like to turn this over to um, the, the Cancer Center Director perspective. Uh, Dr. Jackson Orm is the director of the Uganda Cancer uh, Center, uh, the Uganda Cancer Institute. And, and you've had, um, Dr. Oram, a very strong clinical research program. Um, uh, can you tell us how you built that and also maybe give us some examples of trials both inside and outside of oncology where you've participated in global uh, industry trials? Thank you very much, uh, Julie. Um, a very good question, or a couple of questions that you have asked. Um, the first thing that I want to say is that um, at the building of the Uganda Cancer Institute, uh, we can say has been over years. And all these uh, started on a very strong historical research background uh, in our country here in Uganda. And I would say we are riding on the back of uh, the fundamental discovery that was made in our country in the name of Bucket's lymphoma that happened in 1958. And ever since that discovery, as well as the emphasis on uh, research, uh, our country has not been the same in as far as uh, cancer research is concerned. Uh, because in 1967, when the Institute was established, it was actually meant to kind of facilitate uh, global research uh, on that newly discovered um, uh, uh, cancer that had shown promise in many areas, in the areas of drug development, in the areas of epidemiology, uh, in the areas of laboratory research. So in a way, uh, the model disease showed that you know, there is need for collaborative work as well as uh, looking at cancer from various perspectives, leave alone uh, clinical trials that were done at that time. As you all know very well, 
in the 60s, actually, um, um, chemotherapy or the use of drugs in the treatment of cancer was experimental. And that meant that uh, even the early stage clinical trials uh, for understanding treatment of Bucky's lymphoma had to be done here at the Uganda Cancer Institute, and that is Africa. So I think the first and most important requirement is institutional building. And I think that has not happened quite a lot in Africa, and I would say it's a drawback. And there are reasons for that, including also in our country, uh, because of political instability and many other factors. And to rebuild that kind of background and to the stage where now we have the Uganda Cancer Institute required in the first place, retracing our background in research. And that meant actually that uh, emphasizing uh, to our young generation, to our institutions, to our government, that cancer research is important, is very key. And in order for them to understand, we need to link this cancer research to what people understand as actually uh, is important in the fight against cancer to use the adage that is actually common uh, in this part of the world. And that meant that the place of research in as far as uh, cancer control is concerned need to be emphasized. You cannot convince any policymaker about the importance of research unless it, it can translate into uh, the well-being of the population. So I think in a way also we kind of took that direction and we kind of brought our government on board to understand that what we were doing was not just some degree of curiosity or individual uh, kind of uh, interest that we are trying to pursue, but the interest of the public. So I think that is very important and usually it is underlooked. And the other area which is actually very important is collaboration. I do remember very well, there was a time when uh, the uh, Uganda Cancer Institute or Uganda as a country was actually the, uh, the, 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 the maker for researchers all over the world. That meant that actually that uh, spirit or that culture of collaboration need to be nurtured. And we are very happy that we kept that going. A key example that I can get, give is that of uh, the collaboration we started with the Fred Assistant Cancer Research Center. And that actually started on the back of the HIV research that we have in this country. And we just asked a simple question that, well, we are here all looking at HIV, but you can see cancer is a problem. So what came out, out of that discussion was the need for us to kind of now transition also to looking at other problems in addition to the prevalent problem that researchers are looking at at the moment, which was HIV. The big question that we ask ourselves given the capacity that we had at that time, and also the infrastructure that we did have, how can we mount cancer research? So infrastructure development is very important. And an example that we did with the Fred Assistant Cancer Research Center was for them to look for resources for putting up the infrastructure we needed for carrying out research. The rest is history. We do have actually state-of-the-art uh, infrastructure for doing all kinds of clinical trials you can imagine from even the early stage here in Uganda. And with that, our government also took a leave and said, look, what can we do in order to join this bandwagon? And the government of Uganda has put up a fantastic research facility in addition to what we already have. And that meant that actually the Uganda Cancer Institute is posed to conduct all kinds of research here in the next few years. So I want to say that there is need for us to emphasize research in totality. Of course, we need to talk about a clinical trial being the flagship of research. That is very important. And then the next is to make sure that we improve on the ability of our own people to be innovative and also to come up with their own ideas. And promoting that idea is very, very important. And I want to emphasize that because if we don't do it, then the research will belong to other people, not to the African. And that is one thing that we want to actually avoid here in Uganda. So Julie, if I'm to summarize really, I want to say that the key thing is institutional capacity development and also development of institutions themselves within the country, that's number two. Then number three 
I heard about the regulatory framework. I think that is very, very key. And then of course, uh, number four, uh, the collaborative atmosphere. And number five, the buy-in by government in terms of policy, which should be backed by resources. And we do have that here in Uganda. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aram. And thank you for reminding us about Burkitt's lymphoma. Okay. And, uh, and it's great to hear the, the progress and the needs that you, that you just mentioned. And so we, we also, of course, with any clinical trial, it's, it's about the patient. And so we'd like to get a patient perspective. So we, we'd like to ask uh, Ms. Nakaguti to, uh, what, do you think that patients in Uganda will go on clinical trials? And, and what, are you, what are your perspectives on, on how we can in, enhance clinical trials and, and uh, stimulate patient enrollment and so forth? Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this important discussion. Uh, from my perspective as a patient, I would say yes, patients would be happy to participate in clinical trials, but to some extent, no. Uh, when a person is diagnosed with cancer, the first thing you think about is a cure. Where can I find a cure? Where can I find the best treatment for this disease? And for patients, we see a lot of patients flying out of the country in search for the better treatment and better options for their, their treatment. So if clinical trials were well established in Uganda and in Africa as a whole, we would see patients uh, participating because they want to have a cure and they want to have good outcomes with, from their treatment. Uh, I would also say to some extent, no, uh, because clinical trials are not well understood, but also as we know naturally, there is hesitancy into trials. Uh, patients would think they are used as guinea pigs, uh, they'd be harmed, they are worried about their safety. So uh, patients would be hesitant to participate in clinical trials. But we see this comes in because there is misinformation and there is no information about clinical trials. Patients don't understand what is happening Patients are not aware that there are clinical trials within their countries. And even if they are part of the clinical trials, they don't you know, patients come to us for counseling and they say, I feel the form. I don't know whether I'm in research or not. So you see the patients are not aware of what is happening around them during their treatment. And uh, I, I realize that there, are, there is a uh, staff gaps, um, capacity in terms of uh, experts, patients line up for a long time to, to receive care, to be, to be uh, investigated and such. Patients may have challenges in participating in clinical trials because you may need an investigation that is not available. Many patients need, for example, a PET scan, but he, he, the, the nearest you can get it is in Nairobi and you have to book for months so some of these challenges may even affect patients participating in some of the clinical trials. And also the human capacity, we are understaffed. So I can imagine a, a, an expert taking care of patients and these patients are too many. So, and if you are to be part of the research, then that means many patients will go unattended too. And I want to mention that in addition to what uh, Dr. Ray mentioned that Uganda Cancer Institute has been built on collaborations. I think this is the country in Africa that has brought civil society on board and we've worked closely and meaningfully uh, working together. As an organization, I lead an organization of survivors and I represent patients at Uganda Cancer Institute to table patients' needs and challenges. And because survivors and civil societies are the gatekeepers of the society, Patients begin with us. Patients come to survivors because they trust your story. You mentioned I survived, they will trust that story. And they'll come to us, they consult us. So, but the challenge we have that the civil society's capacity is not built enough. Civil society and advocates are not, being, are not, are not at the table with experts, with oncologists to bring the patient perspective 
But I want to applaud the government of Uganda and the Uganda Cancer Institute, because this is an example that patient representatives sit at the same table with experts and bring out the patient perspective. And I'm happy for this conversation. It's the beginning, but I pray that we continue bringing out these issues, invite patient advocates, and bring out the issues of patients because we are the gatekeepers of the community and the patients consult us. I want to thank you so much. Wow, well, um, Gertrude, thanks for that. Um, uh, you know, the strength of UACASA, the Uganda Women's Cancer Support Organization and supporting clinical trials, um, you know, educating on the importance, helping uh, keep people on trials and getting them. I've seen that happen. Um, you know, your relationship with Dr. Oram and the Uganda Cancer Institute is, is really a model. And we're not going to be able to do this without powerful patient advocates also being at the table. So thanks so much. Um, we have time for some questions. We've had some uh, come in uh, uh, from the audience as well. I'd like to take um, the next question, go back to our very first speaker, uh, Jennifer Dent. Um, uh, so um, a combined, here's two questions for you, uh, both short. Um, there was a question about um, when you were giving your presentation about could we volunteer for one of the AC3T training programs? How would we do that? And then I'd ask you then what's the next step for AC3T? So thank you very much, Dr. Graylow. Um, yes, people can volunteer uh, to participate in our training programs. Um, as the audience should have seen, all of our training programs are based on partnerships across academics, um, experts, across different areas of cancer patient treatment and management and clinical trial development and implementation. So please feel free to reach out to me or anyone on our team um, if you have an area of expertise and you'd like to volunteer um, in capacity building and training. And what's next for AC3T? This is a is still a fairly young platform with currently we have just over 50 profiles that are updated that, that, that present detailed profiles of 50 African clinical trial sites that are eager to participate in international clinical trials and partnerships across PIs and academics globally. So we will continue to um, populate and profile sites and put agreements in place so those sites know what their profiles are. Also, a platform like this uh, is only valuable if it's current and up to date. So our team are working with the PIs at these 50 profiled sites to regularly update the profiles and capabilities of those sites because we've heard today through this panel there are a lot of activities ongoing across different organizations to build capacity. We also um, are just starting to profile the PIs at these sites. We want to bring and feature the African researchers and PIs and their particular research interests in partnering and also asking certain research questions and participating in studies. We also recognize, um, I think it's been fantastic having the Director General of NAFDAC, Professor Adeyeyi participate. We recognize the critical role that regulatory agencies like NAFDAC play in monitoring and encouraging and enabling clinical trials in African countries. So we also, want to work with organizations and are starting those discussions with regulatory agencies like NAFDAC and Professor Adeyeyi's team to be able to make it easier for companies and PIs to um, understand where to go and how to register and participate in clinical trials and what those regulatory processes are in different African countries. So, um, and then lastly, I'll just say, with the AC3T study pool and some of the studies that are being piloted through that study pool, we want to showcase and plan to showcase those studies, the progress and the publications resulting from those studies that will be led by the African PIs that are participating. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jennifer. Um, we have a question, a regulatory question for our US FDA colleagues. Uh, how is, is global data accepted into the, the global data from global clinical trials? Is that accepted into the regulatory uh, pathways in the US? And if um, or Casa would like to, to do sure. that. I can, I can start. I, I think from a clinical perspective, yes, absolutely. We have mechanisms for accepting trial, you know, data from trials that are conducted globally uh, to support uh, action in the United States. And certainly that has been a longstanding uh, tradition now, I think. Uh, but I think what's really important to ensure is that the data that are generated are um, uh, quality, uh, meet the quality and uh, standards uh, for international uh, trial conduct. Um, so we want to have assurance that we can rely on the data, that we have good matching of the data sets to the source data. We have good source documentation. Um, so that's really important. I think another uh, equally important uh, aspect of data from coming from outside the United States is to ensure that um, that we can um, assess uh, applicability to the U.S. population, because uh, you know ultimately that's who we're beholden to uh, when we approve these drugs, um, and so we really need to be able to assess uh, whether there's comparable you know medical care uh, delivery and medical practice um, and, and and other factors that may uh, impact outcomes. So this is really important, and I and we we uh, in the Oncology Center of Excellence and develop Project Orbis, which is a global regulatory uh, program that um, uh, assures the uh, review, uh, submission, review, and hopefully approval of drugs uh, outside the United States concurrent with uh, approval uh, to, the, to the US. Uh, and many times, you know, we've seen approvals in these uh, ex-US uh, regions uh, occur many, many years before they would have ultimately, uh, you know, been approved. Uh, and so part of the reason we developed that program was really to have alignment in standard of care globally to facilitate uh, global clinical trial conduct for um, regulatory submissions. Because if there's not alignment in the standard of care, then it's really difficult to evaluate new therapies um, in these settings. Um, and so that's, that's part of, of what we've been promoting and working very hard. And I think industry has really embraced this program wholeheartedly and the other regulatory agencies that uh, are part of Project Orbis are very happy to participate because FDA, I think US FDA is a premier regulatory authority and really reviewing source data in the way that we do it. And so we're happy to, to collaborate with other regulatory authorities, whether it's through sharing our reviews or just being part of our discussions as we uh, consider the data. But the, but the issue really around ensuring data standards are met and clinical trial conduct standards are met and applicability is really, really uh, germane to that assessment of, of whether the data could support approval of uh, drugs in the United States. Thank you. Dr. Aiello, uh, would you also like to comment, please? Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, I think it, it has been well addressed. and. Uh, uh, trials or data that come from Africa are no different um, from data that come from elsewhere. And uh, the agency has been using data uh, um, that come from outside the United States for a long period of time. And, um, and they contribute a significant uh, role in terms of uh, uh, the advancement of uh, medical product approval. And um, whether it's in oncology or uh, in another discipline such as um, uh, infectious disease and um, in particular tropical infectious disease. I mean, the data that come from Africa had uh, played a significant, significant role in uh, uh, approving products such as antiviral products in particular in area of HIV in the other uh, clinical conditions. And uh, as it was already said, um, we have uh, regulations that allow uh, that uh, data that come from outside the United States would be acceptable to support uh, marketing application here in the US. And um, to meet that criteria, I mean, uh, investigators or sponsors can conduct their studies either under IND or uh, they may uh, conduct also their studies without an IND. 
if it's outside the United States. But to have um, that data uh, accepted by FDA for review, uh, as uh, uh, it was already described, the study in support of that marketing application should be well designed and they should be well conducted and uh, should be performed by um, investigators uh, that are qualified by training and education. And um, in addition, we should, I mean, as regulators, we should be able to validate the data in support of um, marketing application in-house uh, through an on-site inspection, if applicable. Not necessarily, we do not try to validate all the data, but if you come across uh, factors that need to have a validation, we need to be able to validate that data that come from outside the United States, including in continents such as Africa, where there are over 54 countries. And, um, and uh, in general, studies should be uh, conducted according to good clinical practice from the study design uh, until the end, where uh, the, the, the study data would be reported to uh, regulatory agencies. And I do uh, personally, as uh, originally from um, African continent, I do believe Africa can play a significant role. The way um, um, data uh, contributed to, to uh, approve a lot of antiviral products that we are currently using in the US or across the globe. And uh, that is what I would like to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. And it, as we wind down the, this talk, it's, it's been great. I have one quick question and then turn, we'll turn to, to Julie for a wrap and next steps. But uh, to Dr. Friedman, could you please comment, once the clinical trial is done, could you please comment on the subsequent market access of those drugs in Africa? Yeah, th thanks very much, Bill. Um, so clinical, I mean, doing clinical trials has to be linked to access once the drug gets approved and marketed. And one of the biggest barriers that we haven't talked about for pharmaceutical companies to do clinical trials in Africa is that what is the return on investment? That's the question that companies are asking. And, you know, because, um, you know, it's, it, is a, it is a fairly big investment to start expanding to sites in Africa through the CRO, et cetera. Um, and so companies are saying, we do the clinical trials, but then we need to give the drug away for free. And so that's not going to lead to a sustainable business model. So one of the things that Roche did in 2020 in Africa was to do this really innovative partnership with the government on the Ivory Coast that's part of Sub-Saharan Africa. And there was a joint partnership um, co-investing $150 million into, um, into that region. And as a result of that um, partnership, um, patients um, who were getting, there were a few hundred patients per year receiving oncology drugs, that jumped to 3,500 patients per year. And the, the products included Avastin, Rituxin, Vesgo, Bergetta, Ketsilla, Tecentric, and Hem Libra on the Ivory Coast. And after just the first half of this year, overall sales in the Ivory Coast already doubled. Um, and all, the patients were able to receive it at no cost to themselves. So these are the type of things, these are the type of creative partnerships I think we need to be doing in Africa if we really want to ramp up clinical trials in Africa. Right. Thanks. It makes, it's a great example, Jamie. Thank you. Great. So um, the clock is ticking down. Um, what I, how I'd really like to conclude is uh, bringing it back uh, to Africa, to aortic. Um, and uh, Dr. Bello, Dr. Ododina, um, we've talked about the possibility, maybe of a CEO roundtable, get the interested industry members, the other stakeholders, the government, the regulatory stakeholders, the cancer center directors, the patients at the table, maybe um, at an aortic sub-meeting. So I'll throw it back to Dr. Bello, Dr. Ododina. You have two minutes to talk about uh, the next steps uh, that you would see, including is there a possibility of a CEO roundtable? Do you want to go first, Ododina? No, you go first. <laughs> so thank you so much. I mean, uh, this is something that we're looking forward to. Um, the roundtable, hopefully, at the IOTIC virtual conference uh, coming up between the 5th and the 10th. And I'm super excited with all I've been hearing here. You know, we've started this roundtable. Um, we've started collaborating and talking to uh, key opinion leaders in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we had a conference recently virtual with the African Commission on Nuclear Energy, 
where we have talked about clinical trials are moving the agenda forward. We are taking the agenda to the African Union to see how they can support um, clinical trials by in terms of um, creating an endowment for clinical trials, supporting you know uh, research and so. And I'm so happy that uh, um, Professor Moji is really taking the bull by the horn. You know she has done so much. Uh, she has not mentioned to you that uh, she, for the first time, they have established the clinic, uh, good clinical practice um, journal uh, by NAVDAC uh, for the first time that will guide uh, people that are coming here to do clinical trials and so on and so forth. So yes, IOTIC is at the forefront and we'll be very happy to uh, support any endeavor and also to develop a website that just like the global um, and the clinical trial.gov, uh, you know, maybe for Africa so that everybody will come on one, on one, you know, platform and then you'll be able to see what is going on because so many things have been going on. They are disjointed, but we want to bring everybody on one platform. For like him. Yes, like the Aortic Research Co uh, Committee will be happy to help organize and look forward to it. Fantastic. So I think we've started the ball rolling. We've heard a lot of enthusiasm uh, for this, and it will be our job uh, to, to keep the ball rolling. It's going to take collaboration, partnership, um, but I've, I've heard a lot of excitement uh, about uh, the topic of uh, clinical trials in Africa, how this could help the world. And so let's keep the ball moving. Thank you to everybody uh, for participating, for attending this session, and look forward to continued dialogue. Thank you very much. Look forward to next steps. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everybody, and welcome to Africa. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Yes.